Okay, so in the last video we talked about the components we would need to establish a color managed workflow. In this video we're going to start examining one by one of all those components. So let's start with the first one and that would be monitor. Now I wrote down good quality monitor and by that I mean the type of monitor that might be considered a quality monitor for retouching. Because retouching requires a little bit of different monitor than you might use for let's say gaming or just office type applications or even surfing the web right it's a little bit more demanding and also when I talk about retouching I do keep in mind that and if you are a retoucher and you're looking for a professional retouching career you're probably going to not just send your images to the web but also to print in fact that should be one of your goals to be published in some kind of a magazine so my point I'm trying to make is that when I talk about good quality monitor, a lot of these things that I'm going to be talking about is geared toward print and retouching in general, not so much other type um, things you can do on your monitor, such as watching movies. That being said, I also want to point out that I know a lot of people would like me to recommend specific models and manufacturers and so on, but I decided that that's not very practical because in your country there could be different manufacturers available in your part of the country it could be different it could be difference in budget it could be a model that's not new after when you're watching this video so I might recommend one model but then there is a better version of that coming up next year and you watch the tutorial next year and things of that nature right then also I haven't tested all the possible monitors so I can with confidence talk about from personal experience what they are and how good they are so instead I decided to focus on common key attributes that I would look for if I were to buy a monitor for retouching and I think number one component that you need to take into account would probably be viewing angle so let's take a look the one type of panel will give you better viewing angles than another and the lower end is what they call the TN panel or twisted pneumatic that's what it stands for and if you can see on this illustration that I'm sure you've seen this type of uh, monitors before or if you ever worked on most laptops they have the same problem you move your head left and right up and down and your image quite significantly changes appearance the blacks are no longer black uh, colors shift and so on and so forth well that's what you get if your monitor has a TN panel it has a very limiting viewing angle of about some have 10 degrees and others have up to 30 degrees that's probably the best kinda uh, viewing angles that I managed to find in those type of panels on, mon on monitors another one after that is what they call BA panel which stands for vertical alignment and there are different flavors of each of one but that's kinda like a mid-range now I think you should be serious about buying a monitor and you shouldn't look for TN or BA so much but look for what they refer to as IPS panel which stands for in-plane switching now this type of panel has a very very good viewing angle and produces quite accurate color you can go about from I don't know 160 to maybe even uh, 180 degrees and get a very good color this is very useful because then you, know, you can shift <laughs> you, you can um, position a monitor so it's not completely 90 degrees to your eyes uh, like with TN you have to worry about those things then you can shift your weight in the in the chair and you won't get shift in your image as well and things like that if you're working with two people maybe a client next to you or something then it's also very useful because um, they will be looking at it from a different angle and you don't want that them to see a completely different image so definitely I would look for IPS panel type monitor when looking for a monitor. That would be probably my number one thing to look for. So IPS panel and if you go under specifications for your monitor, if you go on some website to buy a monitor, you will see that under panel it will say TN, VA, IPS and then there are different flavors of it. Maybe S, IPS, P, IPS and things like that. Well as long as it has IPS you're pretty much safe. But there are some slight differences you might find in different flavors of IPS I would leave you with Google to check out that if you feel that this is something that you want to go deeper in another very important thing that 
I believe affects the way we view images is the reflection of the surface. And here you have essentially a binary choice. Do you go with matte surface or glossy surface? And my opinion, of course, would be to go with the matte surface. On a matte surface, you don't get any reflections or very little. While with the glossy surface, and this is something that I've noticed is pushed a lot by Apple, especially in their iMacs. They tend to push that type of um, surface because I think it looks cool, you know, it kind of fits with their experience of Mac and all that. And also, it could potentially give you a little bit maybe better contrast or maybe a little bit better saturated colors or something like that. But that's not necessarily what we're looking for when we're looking for retouching, right? So even though it may give you all that, which a lot of users are not retouching on iMac, so that's great for them. For us, that's probably an annoying thing. Now, if you do buy an iMac or you own one, don't worry. You can still retouch. It's not the end of the world. But I would go with, if, if you're buying a new monitor, uh, buying a desktop monitor, I would go with matte surface. Because a glossy surface, even though you can position them in a proper environment to reflect as little as they have to, you're still going to have some issues, right? Especially if it's not in a, in a good environment. You may end up, you know, retouching half the kitchen that's reflecting on your screen as well. So that can lead to awkward moments. And I would, it can also reflect yourself. It's almost like a mirror sometimes. And uh, I would go in the other direction. I would go with matte surface. So for viewing angle, go with IPS panel. For surface reflection, go with matte. Uh, bit depth. Uh, we talked about bit depth in images a lot and in applications and so on. What we haven't discussed is our viewing device, and that's our monitor, right? Well, uh, most TN panel monitors, which would be the, those with have a very poor viewing angle, they usually come with six bits per channel, and that's typically not enough to display a really smooth gradations. In, in your images. So I would try to avoid that as much as I can and good thing about IPS type panels is that if you buy an IPS panel monitor almost certainly you will also get an 8-bit um, type monitor Mo maybe even more if you go with the more higher-end brands but it, it doesn't mean that IPS can never be 6-bit but most of the new IPS panels are always, almost always 8-bit so Usually you don't have to worry about that, but you can always check in the specification on, on the website of the of the manufacturer. Now I say 8-bit or more. Now th you can have 8-bit, 10-bit, 12, even 14-bit in some really higher-end brands. And this sounds really good on paper, but you do have an issue with it when you try to apply that in practice. Because in order for this to work, to, full, to take full advantage of a 10-bit panel type, you know, uh, monitor you have to have different components which all ha support the same bit depth so you need to have a graphic card that supports it you need to have drivers written for it that supports it you need to have a cable that probably goes from you know the graphic card to your to your uh, monitor you need to have a OS that supports it you need to have an application that supports it and you need to have a um, to, so you can you know create an image that supports it. So it's not just that your image may have like 16-bit and you shouldn't see any gradations, but with a lower grade monitor you will see simply because your your monitor can display it. Now what you see here that's a, on screen that's an illustration. That's not an accurate representation of it. You may not get this bad with 6-bit monitors, but you don't maybe even get this great smooth transitions with 8-bit but you're certainly going to get a better rendition. And it also depends on on uh, how you calibrate your monitor. We'll talk about that later. But what I wanted to point out with these components is that let's say you buy a 10-bit monitor. If you have a proper operating system, if you have a proper drivers for a graphic card, a proper graphic card, proper um, cable, a proper image that can display it and all that, then it works. Well, even if you have all that, you don't have one component it's not going to work and that unfortunately seems to be the case when working with Mac OS I believe it's still the problem so if you try to get a 10-bit monitor on Mac OS there is an issue I'm not sure if it's an issue with 
driver is written for the graphic card on that operating system or the operating system itself but you have a weak link there you have a bottleneck and because of that you can display you take advantage you can take advantage of that 10 bit uh, monitor so it works on windows but not on mac so what i would try to do is if you do intend to buy more than 8 bit uh, monitor to Google for 10-bit and Mac operating system which would be Mac OS and try to read what people are saying maybe in the future they will fix that I'm sure they will but at the moment they still have that problem and you will see also more detail on what exactly is the problem so keep that in mind uh, so for viewing angle IPS panel for surface reflection matte or bit depth 8 bits per channel or more that's my recommendation. Uh, color gamut. Now, this is a little bit tricky topic, and color gamut essentially describes what's the range of colors that this device is capable of reproducing. Now, most monitors are standard gamut monitors, what we call them standard gamut monitors, and they're essentially the type of monitor that covers about 100% of sRGB color space. And sRGB color space, it's S stands for standard, and RGB stands, you know, red, green, and blue, the way we produce color. So, the thing is that, I think this was like a more than a decade ago, I believe Microsoft and HP companies decided that they will come up with um, a color space that is an average of monitors at the time, which kind of like a stands for a standard. And the idea was to create something that's very, very common, very um, compatible across devices so that you don't get color shifts and I was all great and good except since then even though the technology has advanced even though some users have moved forward a lot of the users still haven't a lot of the users much of the web almost all of the web is uncolor managed so it doesn't matter and if you post on web you want little color shift as possible so you post as sRGB image right when most of the lower end monitors which most people own are sRGB or standard gamut most devices most scanners and printers and all that they work with sRGB so it's a very very widespread uh, compatible color space which is well received even today and as a result most monitors are standard gamut now this normally wouldn't be a problem and in most cases isn't but there are certain situations where you want to go with the bigger color space and that would be usually Adobe RGB which is about 40% or 30% bigger than the sRGB and monitors that we can, we can reproduce a bigger range of colors those are referred to as wide gamut now first let me talk about the problems that you might find in, in, the, in the situation where you might go with a wider gamut monitor so for example let's this is a small image here on this is just an illustration but let's say you're a fine art photographer and you shoot an image like this or you make an image like this and this is an image that color is the heart of the image if you remove the color there isn't much left it's just not interesting anymore so what you want to do is retain as much color and as much saturation as you possibly can and then you a lot of fine art prints are done on wider gamut monitors which can produce more color more saturated colors than your um, monitor can reproduce on screen so as you remember we talked about how typically you have a problem where you have more saturated colors on your screen but less saturated on your print and you need to compensate for that where this is this is the case where roles are reversed you get a less color visible on your screen and you get to print more saturated colors it's usually better if you if you can go other way around because if you have a monitor I can reproduce more color than your print and through soft proofing you can simulate how it would look when printed but when you're working with a, uh, uh, your um, your standard gamut monitor and you try to print on a wide gamut printer the problem would be that you can soft proof for that because you, you, your device cannot simulate how a more saturated color would look right so that's a problem and when I say saturated colors, I don't mean super bright colors. I mean saturated colors in terms of detail a lot. A lot of the detail doesn't get displayed. 
So for example, if you take a look at this image on screen now, and if I were to have an image that has more color than this monitor can reproduce, I marked it here with the cyan color. This would be known as the colors that are out of gamut, out of gamut, out of range. They cannot be displayed. Now, image might contain these colors, you might be able to print these colors or see it on another screen, but on your screen, you don't see it. You probably would see just red. Uh, even though there are details there, you wouldn't be able to display it. So that's a problem. And if you work with that kind of work, you know, where you, where you need to print that kind of an image and you need to work with very saturated images when you're working with uh, a workflow that's very um, color sensitive, you want to keep that color as much as possible, then standard gamma monitor will probably not give you too many favors. I would go with a wider gamut. And with a wider gamut monitor, you would probably be able to see much of them or if not all of them. Now, when you go to a website to, to look for specification for a monitor, typically sometimes you would see standard and wide gamut marks, but sometimes you won't. But what you will get, almost always see is how much of the certain color space that monitor can cover. So you might get for a wide gamut, you might see it says 98 or 97 or 104, whatever the percentage of Adobe RGB. And that's how you would know it's a wide gamut monitor. And another thing I want to point out is that our cameras can usually capture more color than our monitors can produce, especially standard gamut, smaller gamut monitors. And also you're working with RAW files, so you're working with even bigger space and you're manipulating this color with sliders and you have a lot of, um, a lot of freedom in manipulating this color in an image. And if you have a very saturated image, you want to retain that saturation or accuracy of it, and you're manipulating with this color within Camera Raw or Lightroom, but you're working on a standard gamut monitor, it is very easy to work, as, because you're working essentially half-blind, it's very easy to mess up the colors because you cannot see what you're doing on screen. Too saturated, less saturated than needs to be, and so on and so forth. That's another reason why wide gamut monitor can be a better option. So for color range, if you're doing all sorts of web work, nothing else, you're not sensitive to color, or if you're doing black and white, things like that, go with standard gamut. If you're printing on wide gamut printers or printers that can produce more than, than sRGB and you're sensitive about your color and so on and so forth, go with wider gamut. Now, another thing I want to point out is that wider gamut monitors do have uh, certain drawbacks. Uh, it's not also peachy. It could happen that if you view your images on a calibrated wide gamut monitor inside of a color managed application, you have no problems. But as soon as you, on a calibrated monitor, if you w view your images outside of a color managed application, you get terrible shifts in color. And what all that means and how it looks and how to resolve that, I will actually have to create a video on that because it is confusing. It was very disappointing to me when I bought mine wide gamut and also it's very confusing to find solutions for it so I'll have to record a video on that later but just uh, just something you know if you're buying a wide gamut monitor make sure that you know what that means and how to take advantage of it also the size of your monitor uh, this is uh, something that if you're working on a laptop and if you're working on, on, on the field, don't worry about this. This is for people who know they will invest quite a bit in a monitor, they will put it on their desk and will remain there and they will work 8-10 hours a day for many months or years before they replace it. Then you want to think about size as well. And here's my philosophy. Let's say you have a 27 inch monitor like this one here and the other one is 15.4 MacBook Pro for example, laptop. Um, when you view your image, let's say at 100%, you see your image, but you on a on a bigger monitor, you also get quite a bit of screen real estate. So all of your tools and everything can be positioned properly. Now, some people use uh, two monitors to position their um, you know tools and everything on a second monitor. I don't like that. I like to use one monitor, but it's a personal preference. But what I wanted to point out is that even if you do have two monitors you can stretch your image across two monitors and work on it right so it's about the image not so much about the tools the image this is zoom at let's say a hundred percent and you can see at a hundred percent all the details in her lips 
but at the same time you see all the other parts of the image like her nose like her you know ears and and eyes and you can immediately not just work on the small details because it's zoom 100% but you can also see how that corresponds with details and color and all that with the rest of the image but if you zoom at the same level with the same image on a smaller screen this is what you get so the awareness of what's going on with your image is taken down now don't get me wrong you can use a screen you know an iPad size screen and do wonders with your image but I just think that if you're already investing in your monitor and you're buying I think a bigger one would be a better choice so if you go between these two, I would go with 27. But how much is enough, all right? Well, in my experience, in my view, anything below 21, 22 inches is a bit small for these standards today. And anything over 30 inch is too big. I think that's an overkill. I think that's a home theater, not a, that's a TV, not a monitor. So I would go typically with 24 or 27 inch. I think that's a, that's a good the good size to pick. Now these the, li the, the list that you see here those are the key components that I would be worried about and kinda take into account really take into account when buying a monitor whether I'm buying a, a mid-grade, a lower grade or a higher end there are other stuff but they're more considered a luxury than really 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 beneficial although there are certain you know exceptions where you might want to go for other things but let's you know there are, there are things like contrast or things like luminance and brightness and all that, but some monitors cannot adjust those and they're just fixed. Some monitors we're gonna adjust that when we calibrate our monitor, so it's gonna change anyway. And most monitors who have all of these things that I've listed here would also have pretty decent and, and great all the other features. Uh, basic features such as you know native re resolution and you know the the brightness the contrast and all that stuff that will always that would just be a uh, something that comes along with these features as well and you don't have to worry about that too much there are some advanced features that can be useful uh, but they usually come with uh, very higher end monitors and sometimes you may not have the budget for them for one thing we talked about standard gamut and wide gamut well, there are some good monitors that are wide gamut but have an option to emulate also a standard gamut. So you press a button or you change a setting or something and it, and it switches to standard gamut. And that's a very useful thing to have and I would really like to have that. But what I've heard is that some monitors, not all of them, some higher end are doing a decent job at it, but some monitors tend to pretend that they have this option and they actually can do this, but it's not a good simulation. So it's more of a marketing thing you know hey we have this extra feature but it's not that good so be careful when you're buying and if it has that option to search for reviews and what people are saying about it another thing that's pretty useful I think if you can find in a monitor and depending on what you're buying and what your budget is is also a pretty cool option that we haven't gotten to calibration yet but when you're calibrating you're putting your your hardware device on your screen and it measures what your contrast and color temperature and all that is and then it gives you um, and tells you hey adjust the brightness or contrast of your monitor and then you dig through the menus of your monitor and your buttons on the side and you change that well that's time consuming it's quite inconvenient and it's manual process it's boring it's boring and so on so what I would suggest is there are some monitors who actually communicate with the calibration device directly so you don't have to worry about all those settings you can just do it through software and that's a very handy feature not because it just saves you time and all that and it's quite precise but also because if you're calibrating your monitors for different output destinations for example you might send some of the files to pre-press to a magazine and you might also print at home on a wide gamut printer or something right the same images so what you want to do is you want to calibrate your monitor to fit more closely to whatever the destination would be whether it's your room where you're going to be printing whether it's some gallery where your images would be presented or whether it's a pre-press environment and if you have to if you have a standard you know with standard features monitors and you have a calibrator you have to manually calibrate each time you wanted to match those 
output settings. But if you have a monitor that can communicate with your calibration device directly, then you can set up presets for each and individual of those output destinations. And when you do that, your monitor will, if you just change a preset, it will change the appearance of your monitor on screen and you can match closely your destination, whether it's a web, your own printing, a lab, or prepress or whatever. So that's a very handy feature. And the last thing I want to briefly mention is dineros, you know, how much money you're going to spend. Well, I would uh, say that I would just give you a few one of my own philosophies and you don't have to take this as an advice if you don't want to, but I like to buy much of my hardware second hand. So sometimes it's used, sometimes it's new, but it's just not from the store. And I don't mean illegally, I mean just people, you know, who, just like people who sell second-hand cars, people who sell stuff on eBay and things like that. Now, I, don't, I don't, I can't use in eBay because I live in Croatia, so anything I buy over email, uh, eBay would go over customs and I have to pay like 30% taxes on it, so it's not very useful for me. But within the country, and if you're living in a European Union or if you're living in the United States, that's a very handy thing to take advantage of, you know, eBay or something like that. And you can get very good, clean monitor, good quality monitor that's preserved very well for half the price. And that's a pretty big deal, right? So that's another thing you might want to consider if you're low on budget, but you want to get a better quality. Also, you can, uh, also you can think about buying a model of the monitor that's not the newest one, it's not the latest gadget. Now, if you remove your ego out of the equation, a last year's model could be 20-30% lower in price, but still very, very, very good. So that's another way you can save money. And my personal choice about buying a monitor is buy a monitor that has some of those stuff that I listed. Don't go right away if, if you're starting out or something. Don't go for the higher stand brand, whatever people tell you, because the monitor itself won't make you by default a better retoucher and you are a business you have to make a good business decision and I think that's a waste of money if you really want have that kind of money instead of spending all of it on a monitor I would suggest buy a second-hand monitor a good one and the rest of the money you spend on networking marketing and go to seminars and webinars and so on not so much because of the things you will learn but because of people you will meet there you know the, the, the networking aspect can be very very useful for getting new jobs so I think that's a better business investment than simply spending all of your money on this big huge super great you know science fiction monitor that can do everything but unfortunately you can't so I I would go with um, better distribution of my money than spending everything on a monitor and I know some people like to recommend that you have to buy the top of the line high you know super brand monitor and if you don't buy that you're gonna have some you know it's, you're not professionally you can't see accurately or color and I disagree with that I think that's a great thing to have but it doesn't make you necessarily a better retoucher and it certainly doesn't improve your business by default so think about your investment in money wisely anyway that's my recommendation you can take it or leave it and uh, see you in the next video